Hey guys, today we're going to be continuing our Matthew series. Uh, we've made it to chapter 5. It seems like time is going by so fast. And I just want to continue to encourage you guys that Jesus is the way and Jesus is the only way. He loved you. He still loves you. He died for you. He gave his life and he resurrected so you can have eternal life. In Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be covering the Beatitudes. And it's kind of cool if you uh, break up the words, what I see, out of my own words I see. B, and then the attitudes that you should have, Beatitudes. So maybe many people say that, but to me, that's the first. So here we go. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says, the Sermon on the Mount. And this is where Jesus uh, used uh, uh, this platform, this land. It's kind of like a hilly side uh, by Capernaum. And uh, just decided just that's where he was going to be, where he was going to share uh, this liquid gold with everyone on how we should live our lives and how we should be. Now, they're very contrary to the normal way of living and especially in the land of abundance. Every time you hear in the Bible when they spoke of land of abundance, it was just like, it just seemed like people weren't really close to God. It was like too many distractions. Even in the older biblical days, they didn't have phones, but I'm pretty sure there's all sorts of different kinds of distractions. So just anything to get in the way of you to be able to spend quality time with God, taste, and to be able to see for yourself that this is the best. I had a dream the other day that I asked the Lord to give me about an in particular someone. I said, Lord, can you please help me with this person? Can you please show me what is hindering them from drawing close to you? And the Lord gave me a dream. And that very night, he gave me a dream of the person getting pulled back and forth. Like literally their arm was stretched forward. Their back arm, their other arm was stretched backwards. And they were being pulled by people and circumstances and even children. And, and, and being pulled forward by other people's circumstances and situations. And they were just in this tug of war going back and forth. And... I was like, whoa, wow, really? So I began, I got out on my hands and knees. I started praying for them. I started interceding for them. And I gave them a call. And I told them, I said, the Lord gave me a dream and you were in it. You know, and, um, you know, sometimes they, people tell you, oh, don't say stuff like that. Or not all dreams are meant to be told. And, you know, if you're going to say you had a dream about somebody, <laughs> say you, had a dream and they were in it. Don't say I had a dream about you. People, uh, minds can easily go into different places. So I began to tell this person, I said, I had a dream and you were in it. And I, and I asked God the night before, why were you having so much trouble drawing close to God? And I, he showed me up in my dream of you, you were getting pulled back and forth. Like your arms were stretched out. And it was uh, the kids, circumstances, job, finances, distractions. Just I just started naming all this stuff. And they were like, that's exactly what I'm going through. And man, I started ministering to them. And I said, if you have all of these distractions that are hindering you from the Lord, I was like, well, you're mine right now. And I'm about to give you a whole mouthful. And you're going to say it's good. And so, believe you, no lie. We're on the phone for two hours. And I begin to tell them, how long have you think we've been on the phone? And they were like, I don't know, maybe an hour? I said, we were on the phone for two hours. And they're like, what, really? I said, do you see how much time flies when you're having fun with the Lord? Do you see how much joy it brings do you see that the promises that he said that he will keep you he will hold you you're in his hand and for those whole two hours i just gave you his words 
I gave you uh, some of my life when I was learning about him and when I finally was able to taste and see for myself. Uh, I, I would lock my room, myself in the room for months at a time, for years, months at a time. And I'm just like, well, I'm behind because I see some of these young kids and some of these young kids are being used and doing so much for the Lord. And I said, I'm 35 years old. Well, I didn't say that <laughs> now. I said that back then. Well, I'm in my 20s or something like that. And I'm like, I'm behind. I'm behind. A lot of these people, they're reading their Bibles and they're reading their Bibles and they're going to school and they're, you know, they're doing whatever they got to do to learn. And they're, you know, and I said, I'm behind. So I began to just for years, months, just barricade myself in the room. And, and uh, I would say it's the best investment that I've ever made because what we're going to get into now is all the fruits and blessings for living your life a certain way. And it's pretty cool because maybe some of you have never heard of these uh, eight or nine contractual contractual agreements that the Lord has made. Like, hey, if you do this, this is going to happen. And maybe you guys never heard of what I'm about to read, some of them. But then you find yourself like, hey, I do that. Yeah, because we're made in his image, you know, and... Uh, you know, without him, we're probably running on 10 or 1 or 2 percent. Uh, but with him running on all 16 cylinders, it's very awakening. It's very beautiful. So I want you guys to draw close as I cover this. It's only 12 verses. And the first verse is him preaching the Sermon on the Mount, which it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now this is verse two. Now it has another title on top of it. And it says the Beatitudes. So he begins to preach and he says, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall, they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God and daughters. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, as I read some of that, I'm like coming close to tears. So I kind of put something together to simplify one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, these eight categories. And they're just eight things. They're eight things. And if you really, really want to feel the full embrace of God, if you really want to be able to just know, know that he's with you, and you don't feel him at all, but you just know that he's with you. You know, you see, because that feeling, it brings security. That feeling that you feel when you feel him. Oh, man, you're like on cloud 100 and you know he's with you because you feel him. 
But the thing is, is of knowing that he's with you that same way, but you don't feel him. It's like dead, it's flatlined, you just woke up, and you're like, oh, stretching, like, oh. Yep, I'm human, yep. Feel all kinds of pain. Feel very sore. Man, it was cold last night. Oh, <clears throat> I think I have a cough. I don't know what's going on. Oh. But the whole time, you know he's there. That reverence of just knowing that he's there when you wake up. And you're like, oh, I'm human. Ugh. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm sore. Thank you, Father. Oh, I really, my body doesn't feel like going to work today. Oh, this bed feels so good. But you who strengthened me. Like, whoa, what's going on? What's happening to me? This is things that we can't do on our own accord. It's him who strengthens us. And when you spend so much time with the Lord, and then you come across verses like this, you're like, man, I did some of those things. And now you're, you're but what are these? But what do these mean? And you start to look things up. Okay, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Okay, so then people that are poor and they realize that they need him. It's not financially poor. It's poor in spirit. It's, you know, not being able to wake up every day, knowing that you were designed for something greater. Uh, not being able to wake up every day because maybe you're just getting abused or beat up or by this world. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So, blessed are the poor, they realize it, and they realize that they need him. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. When you come to that realization. Now, we like all kinds of kingdoms of whatever down here. It feels good, money, popularity, fame, fortune, success. Nice cars, nice house. You can say you're not materialistic. And um, I gave you a brand new house with like stained glass windows or windows are wrapped around the house and a wrap around deck and everything you need inside the house. And you, you're not going to smile. You're not going to be like, what? Really? Thank you. Wow. I just gave you a whole kingdom right there. A little kingdom to yourself. Now, this verse is talking about the kingdom of heaven. The eternal, the spiritual, where whether you're in a house or you're in a cardboard box, you know that Jesus is enough and he came to redeem you and he came and he died and he shed his blood on that cross for all of humanity to show that ain't nobody in this world going to suffer as much as me. And I did it for you. That was number one. <laughs> I got seven more. I'll try to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> But so true. The second one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So what I have here is people mourn, comforted. You know, there's a lot of people that have trouble like mourning or let alone crying, crying in front of people. You know, when you ever see somebody crying on the corner... And you should see 50s of people. I'm not going to say hundreds because eventually somebody comes by and says, how are, you, how are you doing? Are you okay? But let's just say groups of 50s of people <laughs> until that one person comes by. And maybe they might not be equipped. Maybe they might not know a lot about God. Maybe they might not know about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to just come in and just grab them out of their mess and just help them, allow them to see that there's something more that is going on. But out of those 50s of groups of people, you see at least one person that will stop and stop by and, and, and check on the person. 
you know, in the, the in the Bible, the the story of the Good Samaritan, when you have like these godly people walking past this man that is battered and almost dying on the floor, and the Samaritan Samar Samaria was categorized as you know a horrible place, there's nothing good there, and out of everybody, religious leaders and godly people, a Samaritan came by, one of the worst, and helped the person. So now I'm talking physically, but this verse is talking spiritually. You know, when the Bible says, when you cry, cry unto me. When you cry on this earth, eventually somebody's going to come along and say, what's wrong? Maybe they can't give you the word, but maybe they'll give you a hug. Maybe they'll give you a couple dollars and try to guess maybe this is your need that you need. Or maybe they'll begin to ask you questions on how they can help. And maybe they might not be able to, but they can direct you on where you can get solid help. Or when it comes down to the very end, at least, they cry with you or give you a hug. Because right here it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now I did all of that to paint a physical aspect. But let's bring it down to its original origin. Because all of this has to do about God. Relationship with God isn't the people uh, depending on the people around you. The relationship with God is depending on God and seeing how selfless we can and give what we have to the people around us that we've figured it out. So like once again, the Bible says that if you're going to cry, the Bible says the Lord says, well, cry unto me. I will comfort you. I will be your Prince of Peace. I will be what you need. And so, like I said earlier, there's a lot of people, they have trouble crying, let alone crying in front of people or showing these emotions. But God wants you to experience the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, the fullness of eternal life. And that's, one, that's number two. <laughs> number three. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, meek is not weak. Meek is one of the meek is one of the most powerful things you can do on this universe. To put yourself aside and to think about the people around you, uh, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter how hard it may be, no matter how scary it may be, no matter what the cost or what you may have to do. Um, to put others before you. As long as it's in a godly sense. And it's good. So. What I have here for meek is. Humble. Inherits. The whole earth. <laughs> and so. Meek is not weak. Jesus was the most meekest person in the world and at the same time the most strongest person in the whole world so never categorize meek as being weak okay number four blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied Okay, so what I have right here is hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. So constantly pursuing words, God's word, pursuing what he says is good out of your own Bible and what he says is right, what he says is just, what he says how we should live, even what he says... Uh, how we should remain silent at sometimes and humble ourselves. So, you show mercy. So, it's like when you do a good deed and people notice and 
I'm like, man, good job. You know, like, we thought you were going to not do the right thing. You get one of those hidden camera shows. And everybody comes out from behind the scene of the restaurant or the behind the counter. And wow, what made you stand up for something so, so righteous, like in, in, in tough, tough times? Like, you know, that that takes bravery to try to stand up for this person. And then the person that was there pursuing the righteous act just begins to cry. I don't know. It just, just felt wrong. I just knew I had to step in. I just knew I had to just do something. And it just wasn't right to me. And they begin to cry. And then the people recording, they begin to cry. And the people that are watching the TV begin to cry. And I don't know how old these videos are going to be. But a TV is a box where you watch other people's lives. So that's in case this video goes 3030. And there's no more TVs. Um, and it says right here, pursuing righteousness, you'll be so satisfied, so content when you walk away that you did what was right, even if nobody knew. God is looking to satisfy us in all ways, but his ways are completely different from the normal point of views that the world is surrounding us. Okay. Number... Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Okay. So I put right here, mercy. You will be shown mercy. <laughs> so a lot of times, like, people can think, like, I don't need nobody. I don't need you. I don't need this. I don't need that. But then in their weakest need, maybe on their deathbed, maybe when they're on a, a, a kind of a close to a deathbed and, and, and then all the people show up that they've done wrong or people that, sh that, that out of nowhere you need their help and they show up and they're just there like, oh my goodness, I don't deserve this. Now they're giving a person that's undeserving of mercy when that person, person didn't give them any kind of mercy. Uh, maybe the house was always dirty. Maybe the dishes were always dirty. Maybe uh, the house was always unorganized. Maybe they were always running late. Maybe they were never on time anywhere. Maybe um, the expectations that they had up here, just the people around them couldn't uphold it. And to them, everything was just a mess. So the Bible says right here, blessed are the merciful, will, they will receive mercy. So now you have a person that never really gave out mercy. Now they're on their deathbed family comes in extends mercy they're confused and they say wow and they're crying now let's just say God takes them off of that deathbed and now they walk away with a whole new set of values don't wait for your deathbed don't wait until it's very end at the very end of time or the very end of the days of your life to surrender to the Lord or wait for these circumstances to arise where you find out late when you have now. The Bible says that if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. That I am just as close as a mention of my name. And God is here. He's here for you day and night. Maybe if you keep your Bible on your, your lampstand and he's right there, two feet away from you. You can start in the book of Matthew. Hey, tag along with, tag along with me. And so you have this person now that has this whole new way of life. And now he's more aware of the real treasures that are eternal than the physical things that really never mattered. So then now the house is dirty and the dishes are dirty and then they're always late and they can't keep up on anything. But he's as quiet as a mockingbird. That's uh, God's humility. God humbled him. <laughs> and it took him having to stress himself out and ending up in a position where 
the doctors are saying, look, if you stress out anymore, you're going to be gone. And the same people that he was tormenting his whole life, or she, they all come and they're there. In a good note, they come and they're there and they extend him mercy and that person's changed. That's the power of Jesus right there. Okay. Another form of mercy is that you're just always extending mercy. Like, you, you got this. You know this. You do it. You do it everywhere you go. And people are ridiculing you and beating you and smacking you down. See, there's two parts to both sides, but I don't have enough time to go through a whole analogy, all right? So, but the second part to this side is that everywhere you go, you're merciful. People are beating you down, smacking you down, never giving you a chance, laughing at you, scrounging at you. You're trying to do your best, but it just seems like it's never enough. You, you No matter what you do, you just can't fit in and you're just mercy. You're meek. You're kind. You're humble. You're generous. You, you, you mourn with them. You cry with them. No matter what you do, they're still smacking you down. But there's one day because you apply all these principles that God just and places you somewhere high and he exalts you because although the people around you were taking advantage of you, he grabs you for all your hard work because he knows what it takes trusting in him having faith walking on water not knowing what's coming next my brother told me today he's a lamp unto my feet you know you don't know what's coming next but i'm gonna take your words lord i'm gonna do it i'm gonna trust you to the last day that i have to live and, whew, whew. and he says good job my good and faithful servant and all those people that did you wrong and they're like, maybe I could do that too. And now they listen. Two things I always tell people. People don't only, only listen to you when they don't know you. That's why I say share these videos because maybe the people you know, they don't know me. So they don't listen to me and hey, they'll come around for you. But that, that takes a selfless act. And people that know you that you just show them how much you love them, no matter what, no matter what. You're always saving their butt, you're always saving their little tail. And uh, little by little, as the years go on, then they start little by little. See, not everybody's gonna be like you. Maybe you got it and you figured it out quickly. You figured it out at a young age, or your mid age, that's still young to me. 60s is still a baby to me. And, um, but then they might not get it. They might get it in their 70s. They might get it in their 80s. I always tell people, okay, you're the coach on the outside of the boxing ring. And whoever's in front of you at hand, whether it be at home, with your family, at jobs, everywhere you go is a boxing ring. And the person that's in front of you is the person in the boxing ring. And God is in that boxing ring behind them, but they're fighting against the devil. Now your job, you can't go in there and box and fight all their battles for them. Sometimes you can. Um, but your job is the coach from the outside. Look, if you just do it like this, then you fall back. Let them box a little bit. Look, if you just do it like that, then you fall back. And you let them box again. And little by little, you will start to see their form shape and start to be more clean and cut and they'll begin to realize that there's no battle at all. All the crazy working hours, all the dramatic stresses, all the circumstances that are going on, the past that's trying to maybe uh, uh, haunt them or saying that it's too late, they can never do it. And they're realizing that the devil actually has no power at all. If the Bible says that we are above the angels and we can call and dispatch angels and Satan is a fallen angel. Wait a minute. Then we are above the angel. Then we are definitely above Satan. The problem is, is that we're not properly equipped. So, once we get this proper uh, equipation, um, now we know how he works. And he has no power at all. The Bible says of the renewing of my mind. Not to be conformed to the world, but the renewing of my mind. So when you're constantly renewing your mind in the word of God, 
it begins to take more precedence and more sound than anything else. And when you do this, you just don't have any more, any room for the devil. It's like, sorry, this all this is preoccupied and he's trying to get in, boom, and it keeps bouncing out and you're just laughing. You're like, man, let me share with others. So, because that's the point of this whole video thing. This is not preachy preachy. This is showing you how wonderful, how beautiful, how God loves you and how much Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you, for everybody. So beautiful. All right, here we go. So we did poor, people that mourn, poor in spirit, people that mourn, they'll be comforted, humble, and inherit the whole earth, hunger and thirst for righteousness, they'll be satisfied. People that show mercy, you'll be shown mercy. The first one was poor in spirit and realize the, and realize they need him, need God, need Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And the next one is pure in heart. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. For they shall see God. It's so cool. Like, you're like, wait a minute. An adult, I was told that I'm going to be sinning and this and that. And that's a lie. You know, like, there's sin that people commit and it's like willful sinning and they don't care, so on and so forth. They learn about God, they get close to God, and then they start sinning a little bit and a little less, or they get closer to God, then they. They're saying it's like accidental or just not properly equipped. Then I get even closer to the Lord. And next thing you know, it's like, man, I'm not doing the stuff I used to do. Who am I? This pureness inside of your heart starts coming. Uh, um, then next thing you know, it's like, oh, an accident. Oh, I slipped there. Oh, I, I, I did a mistake here. Oh I, I, oh, I just sinned there. And you begin to realize the closer and closer you get to God, the more and more sin is not even a factor. But it depends on you. It depends on you. You can say, oh, I love God. God, you know I love you. Yeah, huh? You know? Peace, yeah. You know I love you. Or you can you can really, really just... The Bible says, like I said earlier, if you cry, cry unto me. Use every circumstance to talk to God. Use every circumstance to tell him how much you need him. Go to church. Read your Bible. Share God with other people. Join classes. Join groups. Do whatever you have to do to draw close to God, begin to read his word and allow it to come active in your heart and pursue righteousness, pursue the, the life of, of peace, the life of truth, the life, the life that um, requires full surrender. You know, Lord, you know, the Bible says you have to basically relearn life all over again because everything you were taught without God, without the proper Jesus in place is void. You have no idea what you're doing. So when you begin to take this path and you get so close with God, say, well, how can I have a, a, a pure heart and, and, and there's sin all in my heart? That's the thing. You can't. You need to know Jesus. Jesus is the one that's going to show you. He's going to hold your hand. Every step you take in the sand, he will be right there with you. And he'll begin to show you how to walk, how to talk, how to carry yourself how to love others, how to love the unlovable. And so the Bible says to love your enemies, love those who persecute you, love those who try to harm you, give them food, give them water. It's so contradictory to how we live our lives, where when you apply these values, things change and they change forever. You fall so in love with the Lord that it's not a... Um, Unconditioned of obeying laws and rules and regulations is more of the heart. So let's just say you're driving down the road, right? And this is the difference when Jesus was trying to preach this sermon on the mount. He was, there was also like Pharisees there and all kinds of legalistic people there that were like, okay, we say we have God, but we're more, we're, we care more about the rules, but in the inside we're rotten. We're, we, we, we don't love, we don't share, we're greedy. Some of us just worry about pu pushing political parties and we use God and do whatever we have to do to get there because we care more about outward appearance than inward appearance. So imagine now you're on a highway, right? And if you're trying to live your life according based to all the laws, it's gonna be super hard. But now you live your life according to relationship, not a religion. 
a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. It's only categorized as a religion for the cultural dynamic that goes on around us where then this is a category and you can choose and pick and so on and so forth because um, every religion talks about God or these false gods and so it's just a category. But Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's like trying to call you and your child you know, your child and you have a religion. No, you have a relationship. God is real. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. They're alive. They love us. We love them back. Relationship, not a religion. It's like saying the relationship between you and your parent is a religion. Now, some may say, yeah, because it's all messed up, but you're driving down the road, right? And I'm going to give you two dynamics. One under the law and one under relationship so you're driving down the law down the road and the speed limit is 35 miles an hour so you're driving 35 miles an hour and you see a police officer behind you so you look through the rearview mirror and you say oh please so you look down at your, your speedometer okay 35 miles an hour okay let me slow it down a little bit okay that's legalism that's law that's rules now Let's just say you have a little bundle of joy in the back seat, right? You have a baby in the back seat. So now you're driving and you're more concerned about the speed limit because of the relationship that you have with that precious, beautiful creation, that life back there. Is that religion? That's relationship. And this is what Christianity is trying to offer to people. A relationship with an almighty, powerful God that created the universe, seeing that we were in need for help, came off of his throne down as a human child, born into a world of sin, did not sin, showed us how we should live. And pay for it all and our salvation with a brutal, brutal awakening on that cross when he died for us. If that doesn't paint to you a big, pretty picture that he loves you, then I don't know what else will. Maybe more of these Bible classes that will. And... But it's not just Jesus come into my life, I accept you, and then I do whatever. No, it comes with a change, a transformation, a shift in gears. Okay, I'm going to live this way. And when you live this way, you're forever changed. In the beginning, it's like you trying to fight and you trying to do it yourself. And I'm going to do this because I know it's right. And then automatically, whew, his presence comes. It's like autopilot. It takes time. You get it. Believe. Have faith. So you receive that pure in heart and you will see God. Even in everything you look around, you'll see God in everything, in the good and, and even in the bad. Okay, the next one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So I put right here, people who work for peace, called a child of God. So everywhere you're going, you're trying to just be peaceful, be loving, be gentle. Be kind, trying to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker is a person that um, sees a need and not only trying to create peace within a circumstance because it's deeper than that. A person that um, sees a need or sees trouble or two people quarreling or sees that these two people haven't been talking for quite some time. So he's talking to this one privately. He's talking to this one privately. He's trying to slowly bring them together. Oh, yeah. And you say, how many of you do that on a normal basis, on your own? It's like, well, I'm, I got the kids, and I'm working, and I got school, and I got this, and I got that. Distractions. Distractions. And I'm only saying that because you see how easy it is to not have time for God, let alone do His work. For the people that you love. That was a liar. And kick that guy out and open up our big beautiful hearts that God gave us and begin to put his word in our heart in our mind so we can do good 
people around us need us. And you're probably like, I need the people around me. Well, you'd be surprised, no matter how hard your situation is, if you give it to the Lord, do what you have to do. People that know you need them because you're in a far worse situation than them, how they see physically with the Lord, they'll end up being, we needed them the whole time. God mends, he's a mender. He creates, he builds, he multiplies, it's beautiful. Okay. Persecuted. Okay. The next one is blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So then the last one is like the intense one. You know, you're living for the Lord. You're walking for the Lord. You're walking to walk. You're talking to talk. You're, you're, you're doing everything. Now there's going to be persecution. And I'm pretty sure by like me doing these videos as time goes on and who knows how long that is. People are saying, oh, you see, and they're going to try to say stuff about me or make stuff up about me or lie or this. I've had that my whole life. So I'm like, well, I'm used to it. It's, it's not going to stop. It's never going to stop. So long as there's good people on this earth, there's bad people on this earth. And are you doing it for the people? Or are you doing it for the Lord? And you allow them to see if they want this. And to live a kingdom life and live by kingdom principles. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they were so for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Alright. And before I go, I got something else. And like I said, this is not for a contest. This is not for all like I could stand here like a Pharisee and pretend like I got the perfect actions and the body posture and all that. That's elementary. That's the first thing you learn how to fake in life, right? Yeah, this is not that. No more faking for me. I found Jesus, the real Jesus. Okay. There are at least four ways to understand the Beatitudes. They are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. They contrast kingdom values, what is eternal, with worldly values, what is temporary. They contrast superficial faith of the Pharisees with the real faith that Christ demands. They show how the Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the new kingdom. These Beatitudes are not multiple choice. Pick what you like and leave the rest. They must be taken as a whole. They describe what we should be like as Christian followers. Each Beatitude tells how to be blessed other translations use the words fortunate or happy. The Beatitudes don't promise laughter, pleasure, or earthly prosperity. Jesus turns the world's ideas of happiness upside down. Being blessed by God means the experience of hope, joy, independent of outward circumstances to find hope, joy, and the deepest form of happiness follows, follow Jesus no matter what the cost. With Jesus' announcement, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. People were naturally asking, how do I qualify to be in God's kingdom? Jesus said that God's kingdom is organized differently from worldly kingdoms. In the kingdom of heaven, wealth, power, and authority are unimportant. Kingdom people seek different blessings and benefits, and they have different attitudes. 
Are your attitudes a carbon copy of the world's selfishness, pride, lust for power? Or do they reflect the humility and self-sacrifice of Jesus, your King? Jesus began his sermon with the words that seemed to contradict each other. But God's ways of living usually contradicts the world. If you want to live for God, you must be ready to say and do what seems strange to the world. You must be willing to give when others take. To love when others hate. To help when others abuse. By giving up your own right in order to serve others. You, you will one day receive everything that God has in store for you. Jesus said to rejoice when we're persecuted. Persecution can be good because, number one, it takes our eyes off of earthly rewards. It strips away superficial beliefs. It strengthens the faith of those who endure. And four, and our attitude through it all serves as an example to others who follow behind us how we should live for Christ. We can be conformed to know what God's greatest prophets, that they were persecuted like Elijah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. Our persecution means we have shown ourselves faithful in the future. God will reward the faithful by letting them enter in the kingdom of heaven where there will be no more persecution. Father God, we come before you right now. We come before you right now, Lord, if there's anybody that is tired of the persecution, that is tired of the belittling, of the abuse, that is tired of constantly feeling alone, Lord, that maybe they feel like they're all on their own, Lord, and that nobody cares. Father, I pray right now, we pray that you uplift them, Lord. That you allow them to know that they are not alone. And that you love them. And that you died on a blood-stained cross for them. So, Father God, we lift our hands right now to worship you, Lord. To give you all the honor and all the praise, Lord, to exalt your name, King of King and Lord of Lords, seated at the throne. Lord Jesus, come into our lives. Make us whole. Make us men and women of God prepared to speak before your throne to help others in need, to help others who are broken, who maybe can't muster up the strength, Lord, to get out of their beds, for those who seem hopeless and lost, like maybe I'm too old, maybe it's too late, maybe I've messed up too much, Lord, Bless them right now in the name of Jesus. Touch them right now, Father God, with your holy hands. 
as we extend ours, Lord, and free them, Father. Free them, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, go everywhere they go, Lord. Allow them to feel you right now, Father, that they know that you are real, that they may be able to sleep in comfort no matter where they are in their life or in their circumstances, that they have the Prince of Peace by their side at their right hand to call on to bear up and to push forthward in whatever they do in Jesus mighty name we thank you we thank you
thank you. And we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. sounded any little bit good which I knew it did but I can't even believe I got that out but <clears throat> yeah I've been sick and uh, this right here is only good for speaking <laughs> right now uh, and a little bit of singing but I felt like like that needed to happen like there's somebody that's gonna come across this video. Just something's just gonna just break. Something's gonna shift. Some kind of gears are gonna just and they're gonna surrender. He's everywhere. Everywhere you are, he's there. The Bible says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Romans 8 to 8 says, all things work for the good, for those who love me. Do you love Jesus? Give him your heart. More than your heart, give him your body. Say, not only I'm gonna love you on the inside, from this point out, my outward actions are going to reflect that. You might not do what everybody likes all the time, or you might not do what some people might agree. But as long as you do what's right and you make him happy, he'll work out the rest of the kinks and the details. You just focus on that little lamp that's on your feet one step at a time. And he'll do it. All right, guys, well, you have a wonderful rest of your day. If this reaches you by the evening, if it reaches you by the nighttime, may the Lord do in your life what this was intended for it to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And God bless you guys.